The customs official beckoned me to his counter. Buenas tardes, Miss Morrow. A pleasure to see you again. He reviewed my passport with pages of stamps from previous trips to Mexico. You love visiting our country. Are you going to see family? For seven years, I lived in Mexico. One of my jobs was teaching English to business executives. A student of mine, Javier, said he liked looking at me while I taught because of my colorful skirts. After class conversations led to dating, then getting married. After our daughter, Monica, was born, Javier lost his job. We decided to move to the US. Knowing it would take time for Javier to obtain his work document, I worked temporary jobs until I found a full-time position. We had another child, David. Javier was still out of work. Our family life wasn't easy, but I was determined to keep us afloat. My company had a trade show in Las Vegas. Javier said, I am against you traveling for work. I told him, if I don't go, my job is in jeopardy. Then, Javier received a call from an international company about a position based in Dallas. After two promising interviews, another one remained. Javier had to go to Mexico and meet with the vice president. The date coincided with my trade show trip. Finally, things were looking up. A close friend, Anne, offered to take care of the kids while we were both away. As I stood in the trade show booth, I was getting increasingly worried. I had not heard from either Javier or Anne. I called Anne using the phone at the booth. Oh, to have had a cell phone and call and text. Javier had not yet dropped them off. I tried not to convey to Anne that something did not feel right. I'll call you again about six. I tried calling Monica's school. Everyone had left for the day. At six, Anne answered first ring. Monica and David are not here. No word at all from Javier. I called your home several times. No answer. I'm going to call the police and hospitals. I left the trade show and went back to the hotel. Anne and I talked again and again, nothing. It was now 7.15 p.m. in Dallas. I paged Javier at the airport before his flight left at 8. No luck. I paced up and down the reddish-brown carpet in the hotel room. What should I do? It was too early for Javier to have arrived in Mexico City. Then I thought of Monica's kindergarten teacher, Mrs. Clark. She would know if Monica had been in school that day. How come I did not think of her before? I got her number from information. She told me Javier had called the school that morning, saying Monica was not feeling well and would not be there. I started to shake. Something was extremely wrong. I felt it in the deepest part of my stomach and being. Anne called me. I feel so helpless. Neither the police nor the hospitals have received any reports. I was beyond distraught. I had to know where Monica and David were. I kept calling Javier's family members. No answer. The following afternoon, standing by the window in my hotel room as the sun was setting, my sister-in-law finally answered. 
She very reluctantly put Javier on the phone. He said, I am in Mexico City. Monica and David are with me. We are not coming back. I crumbled onto the floor. My screams echoed through the hotel. I found my boss and his wife playing roulette. I told them what happened. Kevin handed me a thousand dollar chip, told me to get a flight back to Dallas and do what I needed to, bring Monica and David home. In a desperate frenzy, I made calls, organized a plan, and got on a flight to Mexico. But I could not find them. Javier kept moving them around. Neither law enforcement nor private investigators were able to track him. I went into denial. It felt better that way. I met Earl, my rock. We eventually married. The pain of not being with my children got greater, yet my will got stronger as I kept searching. Nothing led me to Monica and David. Twelve years later, my phone rang. It was my attorney. I just spoke with your daughter. I dropped the phone in shock and joy, shaking and crying. Could this nightmare be over? My precious children were alive, and I was going to see them again. Arrangements were made for me to meet Monica and David in a hotel outside of Mexico City. I paced back and forth in the lobby. My stomach was in knots. Will they remember me? Will they run to me? Will they hug me? After waiting two and a half hours, four people sauntered toward me. Monica was stunning at 18 years old. Her brown eyes were still big. The chubby little cheeks with a dimple on the left were still there without the chubbiness. David, only two when I last saw him, was now tall and gangly. Where was the twinkle in his eye, though? Javier looked dark, foreboding, and smug. A woman had her arm tucked into his. She looked at me like, what the hell are you doing here? Monica and David did not say anything. I did not know whether to hug them. I did not want to push, so I shakily smiled, unable to utter a word. My insides were screaming. The three of us went to a table and sat down. Javier and Rent-A-Wife sat at another table nearby. <laughs> Monica looked at me darkly. I thought you were dead. David asked, why didn't you come before? I cried as I told them everything I had done to find them. I never stopped loving you. I never lost hope that we would be a family again. Feeling like a stranger to my children was horribly painful. As much as I wanted to bring them back to Dallas with me right then and there, their lives were in Mexico. So I made frequent trips, Earl as well, to spend time together overcoming emotional, cultural, and language challenges. I had to be patient as we got to know one another. 
After all the lies they were told about me, it's taken time for them to make sense of the truth. The first time they called me mom, I knew I had finally earned their trust. It's been 19 years since we were reunited. David now lives and works in Dallas. Monica is married and travels from Mexico City to Dallas so we can all be together. She and I are planning a mother-daughter trip in the fall. Javier stole 12 years from our family life, and I'm still struggling with forgiveness. I channel my energy into providing post-reunification support to families through the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. If I have learned anything about this, it's that I will go all over the map for the love of family.